complicated. You know, man, it's like a damn Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man, then you get to one side and plug it, man. All right, Daryl Cooper, welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing, man? Good. Thanks for having me, man. This should be fun. Yeah, I'm. I'm really looking forward to it. I've. I think I found your work. What? Oh, geez, it would have been probably the Jonestown series. And uh, I was working construction at the time. And let me tell you, uh, binging an entire series on uh, on Jonestown while you're in like a hot <laughs> 110 degree attic is uh, is a hell of an experience, man. But I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, it should be fun. When I was working on that series, you know, there's about a thousand total hours of uh, meetings and Jones's sermons, ranting about things and stuff that the FBI sees. They're all available online. And I was working overseas at the time by myself. And so when I'd be working by myself, probably for about three months, eight hours a day, I would be listening to Jim Jones rant in my ears. So. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It was a, a fascinating series, but not necessarily what we're here to talk about tonight. So hypothetically, you know, if people don't know who you are and, and what you do, could you describe, you know, what you do on the internet? Uh, yeah. So I have a podcast called Martyr Made. Uh, it's a history podcast, long form, uh, sometimes very long form. I think the Jonestown series has like an eight hour episode in it uh, where I just dive deep into historical topics. Um, not any particular historical era or anything, really. I just kind of follow my own uh, my own muse, something I'll get obsessed with for a while and hang on that. And um, uh, I, I've got a uh, another podcast that I do with my friend Jocko Willink. That one's called The Unraveling, and uh, and that one's also we deal with a lot of historical stuff, but mostly more his historical stuff that's relevant to the present day. So 20th century history, American history, uh, things like that. And sometimes we talk about contemporary events if there's something in the news. Uh, and that's about it. Well, fair enough, man. So you've also been doing a series on American <laughs> identity, right? Called uh, Whose America Is In Any Way. And uh, that's actually an interesting question, one that I've been thinking about a lot. Because, and I don't normally try to cover current events really at all, but one of the things that's kind of come up in the last you know, four to eight years is this concept of you know, like, what is an American, right? What is the soul of America? And, you know, the French do this thing, right? Where they number <clears throat> their republics, right? You're, I think they're on their fourth or fifth. And right. obviously we don't explicitly do that in America, but there are kind of different dispensations of America, right? To take a theological word. And so yes. uh, I'm curious, right? Like, where do you see the genesis of a particularly American quote unquote uh, identity? And uh, how does that kind of evolve through kind of like the early history of our country? I think the, the first thing to take account of is that American identity has been in flux practically since the beginning, right? Uh, the British settlers who were here uh, were almost immediately, I mean, within a couple decades, uh, the big cities were being swamped by Germans and Irish. And then a uh, generation after that, you start getting Southern and Eastern Europeans. And it, it sort of just continues like that more or less uh, uh, since the beginning of our history, even after the 1924 Immigration Act slowed down immigration to, to almost nothing. You know, immediately at that point uh, commenced the great migration of blacks out of the South and uh, into the into the cities of the North and West, which forced the European ethnics in those cities to sort of reevaluate their own identities. And, and and then by the time that got uh, sort of that, that kind of came to a close, the great migration in the 1960s. You know, we had that the, the cultural revolution and very quickly uh, the immigration laws were changed back and, and we've had a giant flood from the third world. And, you know, increasingly we're sort of to the point now where, um, you know, it's funny, you can you, you can do, you can't do uh, like revisionist history without getting in trouble on the Civil War. You can't do it on World War Two. You can't do it on the civil rights movement. You can totally do it now on the American Revolution and nobody cares. Like you can say that 
the you know the the Americans were the bad guys or the British. You, know, you can do whatever you want. Nobody cares. And it's because that is really uh, for for so many people now enough like a critical mass of people is really not a core part of the American story for them. A core part of the American identity. Uh, the others still have uh, some political salience today, and and people take them seriously. But you got to imagine that. You know, uh, as much as somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. has been turned into a, a, a like a pseudo religious figure in our in our society, uh, if demographics keep turning over uh, at the rate that they, they, they that they have been for another generation or so, he's going to face the same fate. Like everything is going to just keep fading into the past, and, and and you'll have a country that kind of exists in this eternal fluctuating present, where. Uh, you know, people, uh, what it is that, that, that is defined as, as the American story and our, and our sacred symbols and all that will be shifting from generation to generation. So, well, you know, it's something that's only had brief periods of stability, like throughout our history, right? Like in the immediate post-war, post-World War II uh, era. And that's what, you know, it's funny. It's, it's, it's not a mistake that when conservatives today think back to like, what is America? What is American? is they think back to that immediate post-war period. Like that's what most people think about. And you know, you have the 50s cartoon memes and like just that's kind of what people, e even as early as like the, like the, the mid 70s, right? After American culture had just been kind of thrown into a blender in the late 60s, you know, 1973, George Lucas uh, releases American Graffiti, which is like the first sort of 50s, idealized 50s piece of pop culture and then the next year uh happy days comes out and for a while people like you would see a flood of these things that were idealizing the 50s as the time before everything was so crazy and so confusing and um you know and, and even today that period from you know uh, world war ii up to maybe say the assassination of john f kennedy or so or the watts riots in 65 maybe uh, people, that's the, that's the period that conservatives still look to today because, you know, if you go back before that time, you know, you had a country that was obviously divided uh, sectionally, uh, you know, even after the Civil War and Reconstruction kind of came to a close. You have a city like Vicksburg that, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, didn't celebrate the 4th of July after the Civil War up until the 4th of July of 1944, uh, the year after, you know, or, or the same year, one month after uh, the Normandy invasions and patriotism's at an all-time high. And so you have this city that, you know, hasn't celebrated the birth of the country in, in 80 years, who takes that back up. And so it healed some of those North-South wounds. It brought all of these just disparate European ethnics who prior, you know, prior to the war were, um, you know, were kind of looked at uh, suspiciously by a lot of people. They looked at each other suspiciously. Like there was always a question of how American they were and how, you know, Jewish or Italian or, or whatever they were. And World War II kind of, you know, kind of kind of brought all those people together in a pretty powerful way. And so you have this period after the war is over where, you know, there really was like, it's crazy if you go back and look at, at big national polling in the 1950s. I mean, it's crazy. Like, it w you know, they, they, they would ask questions. And I'm talking like Pew poll, Gallup poll, whatever, like Life magazine, big giant, you know, polls. Uh, they would ask people like, you know, do you expect your, uh, the country to be better in 10 years than it is now? Or how are, are you, uh, you know, um, unsatisfied with your life all the way on up to like satisfied and very satisfied. And like 90% of people would say very satisfied or satisfied with my life. 90% of people say 10 years from now, the country's definitely going to be a better place. And there's just a, a huge amount of, of optimism and a huge amount of uh, sort of genuine patriotism between people where people who had not always looked at each other necessarily as neighbors before we're doing that to, you know, an unprecedented degree. Uh, obviously the fly in that whole ointment was the African American population with Jim Crow still going on and, you know, sort of uh, segregation 
taking you know taking place in, in a more indirect way in the in the cities of the north and west and in the 60s uh you know that that uh that fly kind of mutated into a beast that began to you know tear everything apart again in a way and so you know it's something that uh we've we've this, these are questions that we're asking now for very acute reasons, uh, but that have really been there from the foundation of the country, you know? Well, certainly. And, you know, the re I think it's, it's a suit that you bring up 1776, you know, Washington as this sort of <clears throat> mythological figure, right? Obviously he's a real man. I mean, myth in the sort of civilizational sense of that word. Because mm -hmm. actually, I wrote a piece in, in the Blaze about this that kind of brings up a, a point that you know we're sort of seeing a transition of civic religions, right? And you know, even MLK was sort of a compromise figure, right? He was a way to tie in the civil rights regime to a previous American tradition, right? And if you notice, the like current social radicals don't particularly like MLK. It's kind of fallen out of fashion. And is really only championed by like conservatives effectively. But what we see now, and I think that the, in the issue of <clears throat> statues getting pulled down, you know, art being removed on one hand, right. There's the destruction of culture, which is bad, but it really is sort of, it shows behind the scenes, right. That the faith that those symbols or sort of totems of has at least died in a large portion of the public, right. They don't hold their power anymore. And they're being replaced quick, with new sorry. sacred symbols. Yes. Can you repeat like the last 10 seconds? For some reason, we cut it out. Oh, yeah. No worries. What I was basically just saying is that uh, the issue of, you know, statues being removed, uh, those kind of things is actually symbolic of a bigger change, right? Where we're seeing a transition from one sort of state civic religion, right? That of, and I realize again, like going back to my analogy with the republics, we're kind of on that was a modified version of a different one, right? Like I'm not saying it's contiguous, but it's being replaced with a whole new set of symbols and figures, right? Like MLK himself has sort of fallen out of fashion with certain radicals. And obviously that's something that happened multiple times, right? Like you have Christopher Columbus, who is, you know, essentially created as a, as a figure to tie in the Italian American community to that national narrative. And so it's interesting to see, you know, instead of a contiguous evolution, right? Like we add a figure here, we, we sort of emphasize different things to sort of a, a new break and a new story being told. Like Moldbug has this idea of the two story state, you know, like two different political formulas kind of battling it out. And again, right, you're, you're hundred percent correct that the debate over what an American is, or even let's be honest, the scope of what America means, you know, is changing, but it is kind of interesting to watch that that old religion <clears throat> dying from a certain perspective. Yeah, no question about it. Um, you know, in the last, let's say, well, since the 1960s, really, uh, you know, most identities among white Americans, at least, have pretty much dissolved, right? You used to have people, and this is so hard for people today to even really imagine, but you know, up until really like in, in, in a lot of cities out west, I mean, the, until the 60s, but even in the even in the northern cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, these places, you know, up until uh, the early 50s, these places were still, you know, 85, 90 percent European population in these cities. And they were in, in the European peoples who were there, they, they really didn't think of themselves in a, in a day-to-day -day, like operative basis they didn't think of their identity primarily as as white people that wasn't something that you really got in the northern and western cities much until the 1960s when you have the confrontation with the black migration that you know starts to cause the european ethnics to look across ethnic lines and sort of reevaluate uh their, their identities and and who their friends and enemies are and and, and so forth you know, before that, it was, uh, you know, you were you were Protestant Jewish Catholic. You were, uh, you know, Irish, and you lived in the Irish neighborhood, or you were Italian. You lived in the Italian neighborhood and went to a church that you know was full of Italians. And uh, when you voted uh, in in a city election, like these were very 
you know, these, these were very important factors to the point that a lot of big cities would have sort of unspoken but, but universally understood uh, rules that uh, power had to be shared in certain ways. So if they're, you know, in New York City, if there's an Italian mayor, then there's got to be, you know, X number of, uh, of, of Jews and Irish and so forth in his cabinet to do uh, certain functions. And, you know, this is something that emerged sort of organically uh, in, 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 across, in cities across the country. When you come to, uh, you know, since the 1960s, both as a result of, of you know, white flight, you know, the black migration forcing a lot of those white people out of the cities into the suburbs so that you're no longer in an Italian neighborhood. You're an Italian guy with an Irish neighbor and a Jewish neighbor on the other side or something. Um, and you don't go to a church that's just full of Italians because you'd have to drive 45 minutes into the city and it's all just some old people who still go there anyway. And so you don't do that. And so you know, the, the religious identities, the ethnic identities, these things that, that were not, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the ethnic identities back then were not something that, you know, like I'm Irish and I, and I like St. Patrick's Day and I root for Notre Dame or something. I mean, these were things that, you, you know, you lived among your people and they shaped your daily existence and, and the expectations that you, uh, that, that were placed on you and, uh, it was, it was, you were deeply embedded in, in, in this system. And so, uh, very quickly, I mean, really like the you know, 1960s was not that long ago in historical time. Uh, we went from, you know, a, a sort of a way of life where I, I guess, you know, you could say all the way back to, uh, when homo sapiens first, first, you know, started, to put tools together or something, people lived among their kin or, you know, as we got a little more developed, at least among their symbolic kin. And, you know, they grew up and that's the air they breathed. And, and their identity was, to a large degree, was something that was given to them. You know, we have this sort of idea in America today that, you know, uh, being able to choose your own identity is somehow fundamental to American freedom or something. But I, I, you know, I think realistically, when you look out, you see that identities that you choose are, are, are usually surface level, you know, ersatz sort of really fake identities, you know, deep identities are something that are, are, are given to us uh, maybe as one of a couple choices, but usually not. Usually it's something that's simply imposed on us. And, you know, it's those things that you that you really don't have a say in that that uh, play the biggest part in making you who you are. And ever since the 1960s, when people moved out to the suburbs, and they, you know, the Cultural Revolution sort of caused them to identify somewhat less with their religion, and you know, more with, uh, you know, people got more absorbed in in media. You know, that started to define define them, you know, to, to cause them to think in terms uh, that were sort of nationally homogenous, you know, everybody's watching the same TV shows, regardless of what ethnicity they're, they are, or what part of the country they live in or whatever. And so there's this homogenization taking place. And so all of these touchstones that we had, uh, that, that, that people had collected around for their, for their various identities that kind of rooted them to, to something we're all kind of done away with within just a couple decades, you know, after again, living that way pretty much since we've been people. And today, you know, uh, people, uh, people are really trying to find a way to see what pieces are laying around them on the floor to try to, to put something back together because you can't live without, without identity. And I think over the last several years, like you said, four to eight years, and, and, and maybe it's about that, you know, uh, the, um, the immigration issue the, and the real demographic transformation in the country, um, it, you know, it, the, the, the law was changed in, in 65, but uh, through the end of the 60s and much of the 70s, there still wasn't a ton, you know, that people were noticing. Into the 80s, you started to see it like in the Southwest and stuff. And it wasn't until the 90s that people, that it kind of exploded as a national issue. And then over the last 
you know, maybe 10, 15 years or something that, you know, it, it's sort of, it, it's become something of a, you know, the, the demographic question has become something of a, of a crisis for the simple reason that, uh, you know, the, the elite culture and elite institutions have kind of mobilized themselves uh, to, or, or, or rather have, have put themselves to the task of uh, mobilizing the identities of the various groups of people in the country in, in order to uh, solidify, you know, support for the program. And so, you know, you have like these, like you have white people in, in America who've lived out in the suburbs and were more or less kind of content to uh, just not really have much of, of a group identity, not to really think of themselves, you know, to be sort of, um, you know, lighthearted civic nationalists, basically, um, as long as things were going well. And all of a sudden they found themselves confronted with, you know, uh, with, with large numbers of people who, uh, who do not lack an identity at all. They, they have a very strong sense of who they are and, and who their identity is. And, you know, I think since, uh, you know, the, the education system, uh, a lot of the media and so forth has really, especially again over the last 10 or 15 years, gone so far toward um, trying to mobilize the support of all those other uh, groups that have come in since the 1960s, uh, primarily by providing them with, uh, you know, a common enemy and, and, and uh, that, 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 that it has sort of been, you know, something of a, of a shock to white Americans and, and, you know, to be the only people without an identity in a country that, you know, you're increasingly becoming a minority and is a scary thing. And so uh, they've kind of been scrambling to find something, right. And that's kind of what MAGA is in a way like MAGA is sort of an, uh, you know, and obviously um, it's, you know, it's kind of a, this kind of sounds like a contradiction because MAGA seems to have more support among like Latinos and, if the polls are right right now, maybe among black males, then, you know, Mitt Romney or John McCain was ever going to get. Uh, but at heart, it, you know, it's a vehicle for uh, white politics in the country. Like, that's sort of what it is. And, um, you know, you can't, you know, white people are, are sort of confronted with this difficult question where, you know, the, the society is imposing this identity on them, whether they want it or not. Right. If you take a guy like Sam Harris, who uh, is Jewish, he had Jewish parents, right? Jewish ancestors, uh, but he's not a Jew in any meaningful sense. He doesn't think of himself that way. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't. He just he just doesn't think of himself as a as a Jew for in, in any like sort of operative way. But if you were to put him in a time machine and transport him back to Munich in 1935, he would feel like a Jew very very quickly. And he would even start to develop a sense of solidarity with the other Jews who are around him there in Munich, because sometimes other people get to, you know, uh, shape the outline of what your identity is going to be. And so, you know, white Americans find themselves in this spot now where the whole culture, the media, educate, everything is telling them, not only are you white people, um, that that is the it, it, it's it's a it's a primary it's your primary attribute. It's your governing attribute that determines everything else about you. And yet at the same time, uh, they're told that if they identify with their race, that's not only evil, it's the primary evil in our society. And so, you know, and, and so they're kind of seeking around, looking around for something to base an identity on that, uh, that speaks reality, you know, it has some, has some basis in reality, uh, but that isn't going to make them feel like they're completely outside of the sort of value system that they've imbibed since they were children, you know? And, and it, it's, it, that's why there's so, it's one of the, why there's so much chaos out there right now. So there's a lot in there that I, I want to address. You know, I think that the, those unchosen bonds, right. The things you don't consent <clears throat> to are, are, obviously extremely, extremely important. And, uh, you know, for a lot of us that sort of rankles are kind of like individualist priors, right? Like I, you want to 
not you personally, obviously, like to be able to choose those things. You know, I am my own kind of self-made man to put it in like a more right-wing framework. But, you know, you see this particularly in you know, people in my generation, right, Gen Z, who are so desperate for an identity, right? Like every once in a while you see these kind of like, you know, right-wing rage bait clips of, you know, like some, you know, some dumb kid who's invented some bizarre pronouns to define themselves, right? But that's actually kind of an interesting thing when you think about it, right? That is someone searching for an identity, right? Something beyond what they've been assigned at birth, right? To use their language. And I think that that, that really does speak to <clears throat> the kind of like death of a real culture, at least in, in that person, right? They have no kind of strong identity. And so they're forced to, to use your words, like create this weird, like ersatz abomination. Right. And the Arabs have this idea, which can be translated roughly as like in group preference, right? Asabiya, where you get, you know, assassin and some other terms from, right? It, it's kind of just like chauvinism. But it's this idea that you gain your group identity from hardship, right? From external negative pressure. And obviously there's, you know, basic biological characteristics that you share, right? But if we're talking about creating an identity as a group, it is one forged by you know, shared suffering, right? Like you see this in certain immigrant groups, right? Like the the Irish were kind of unified in America, obviously by their, their nationality, but also by the fact that they were looked down upon, right? They were stuck in certain areas together. You know, very clearly you see this with black Americans. They reference their shared suffering all the time. And so when you look at white Americans, right? That kind of white group created in the 20th century, they really don't have any type of shared suffering. Now, part of that is due to the fact that, you know, at the kind of the country was doing really well through the last half of the 20th century. And obviously the conditions now are not quite what I would describe as suffering, right? But at the same time, you know, if if Harvard says, you know, whites need not apply, you know, or if an institution says, even if you don't necessarily view yourself as white, well, everyone else does. And I think that you're you're dead on with the kind of like contradictory nature of MAGA because on one hand it is almost hyper liberal, you know what they love how diverse it is. They MAGA Inc really loves that factor, but at the same time it really is a a like political vehicle for the deplorables, right? Which is basically middle class <clears throat> and lower class white people, and uh, I, I think that that's really an interesting. An interesting thing because so much of American elite culture, I wouldn't say American, so much of Western elite culture, because you see this in, you know, like Canada and, and Germany and you know other places in kind of like the American sphere of influence is basically devoted to dunking on those people, right? Calling them deplorables, right? To quote Hillary, you know, calling them bitter hangers on to quote Obama. And again, I, I think that that's a really interesting experiment because despite all of that outward pressure, right? There hasn't really been a group identity, but I think you're starting to see one born, right? MAGA is kind of a version of that, but, you know, more and more people are just saying, and I mean, even people to, to my left, you know, like, like Matt Walsh or some of the guys at the Daily Wire, like, oh, that is anti-white bigotry or anti-white, it's, you know, race hatred, which I mean, it certainly <clears throat> is, but that is something that would, was not racially permissible to say I mean, even in the '90s, right? Like people laughed yeah, I, at Rush I mean, Limbaugh even a, for his idea of even a couple racism. years ago. I think even a couple of years ago, you wouldn't hear that from anybody except dissidents and like radicals. No, certainly, and and again, like I'm not like white identity isn't my thing per se. Yeah, yeah. But it's an interesting thing to watch because you know, from the perspective of someone who you know, a movement that was allegedly pushing for like a, a society beyond race, they sort of achieved it, you know, at least in a certain like segment of society. Cause I, I mean, I genuinely yeah. think that like, if you actually got into the numbers, middle-class white people are probably the least racist people in the world. In probably the hit in probably the history of the world, honestly. I mean, you yeah. throw like members of the underclass together in, in a place where they're butted up against each other. People are going to have problems, you know, with one another. That's just going to happen. But yeah, you get uh, just a little bit above that. And yeah, there's no question about it. 
And I think that that's, that's probably, I guess, like the interesting thing, like the kind of like the tragic hubris of all of this, right? Is that yeah. you know, they sort of got everything they wanted and then it all fell apart. Yeah. You know, the reason I, I, I brought up white Americans and kind of focused on that for a minute is that, you know, we're talking about American identity and, you know, Arab Americans could change, kind of have a revolution in their group identity tomorrow. And it wouldn't really have much of uh, an impact on what it means to be an American, right? An American identity or something. But, you know, the white people in the country who are really in a lot of ways without a group identity, at least any kind of a firm one, and certainly not a collective uh, one that, that reaches, you know, most of them, um, whatever they settle on, like that's going to affect what it means to be an American. And uh, it's going to affect everybody, even, you know, non-white people are going to have to sort of uh, adjust to and, and, and deal with that situation. And so, you know, you kind of have to, you know, they're also, you know, the other thing is that white people are really, again, the only group of people in the country who don't have an identity. So they're going through this process uh, and, and, and asking these questions that we're talking about in a way that, uh, that other groups really don't have to, you know, um, other group, you know, like, it's funny, like you brought up Arabs, you don't find a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Arab people who come from Arab Muslim families in America, um, who are putting pronoun pronouns in their bios and things like that. And it's not just because, well, they're from a super conservative culture and they're afraid they'll, you know, get in trouble or get attacked or something. It's that, they don't have to go searching for an identity the same way, you know, that white suburban kid does. Like they, they have one and you can, in, in a lot of ways, you know, they would tell you, uh, you hear the, the same thing from, you know, a lot of like Mediterranean people, Southern Italians, Greeks and stuff. Uh, they'll tell you that like, you know, they have too much identity. They're too embedded in their group and to the point where they feel boxed in and that, like, you know, too much of who they are is determined by their extended family and so forth. So they're, you know, their identity is firm, firmly rooted, though. And, uh, you know, you, one thing you brought up uh, about, uh, I, th I think, yeah, you're talking about the sort of transnational uh, Western elite uh, really kind of stepping up their uh, disdain and, and, and even hostility for uh, the, the, the bad whites, the deplorables, right? Is that that's something that has been. Uh, that's an American tradition that goes back pretty much as far as you can, uh, as far as you can go as well. You know, um, if you go back to the pre-Civil War era, look at things people in the North, you know, the Northern press was writing about uh, poor Southerners and, and not just poor Southern, Southerners, but slaveholders as well. There's a tremendous amount of prejudice there. And it, it and there, uh, you know, something about um let's put it this way so like after the civil war um you know or rather before the civil war we if you were going to talk about the elites you really have to talk about you know do you mean in the north or do you mean in the south afterwards uh you know for a, for quite a while uh the eastern establishment you know the, the the northern elites were kind of the dominant cultural and political and economic force in the country and determined a lot of you know, the, uh, the direction that the, that the country ended up taking, obviously, for the next probably two or three generations. And, um, you know, those people like up there, the the sort of elite wasps of the Northeast, and I always get in trouble. Like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, coming down on the eternal Anglo or anything like that. Like, these, in a lot of ways, were very great people. But if you, if you follow uh, their trajectory, you know, throughout American history, really, They've always, to to a considerable degree, have always uh, derived their own identity, their sense of who they are, by differentiating themselves from the bad whites in the country. You know, whether that was we're not like those southern slaveholders, or it transforms later into you know we're not like these Irish and Italians and Jews who you know once the Great Migration comes in, they're fighting against integration and. We're not like those, uh, you know, those whites down south who are who are protesting integration of, of, of their universities. And, 
it you know it, it, and it continues all the way up to today i mean even in the interregnum between the the 60s and now you know you had uh, a very strong tendency to sort of uh you know because the you know the after the 19 yeah, say like the early from the early 60s maybe the rise of goldwater the sun belt uh was became a prominent political force in the country that kind of challenged the eastern establishment in a lot of ways you know um you know, this is a place where the economy was really driven by Cold War industries. And so, you know, evangelical, uh, very anti-communist and conservative in a in a sort of Nixon, Reagan kind of way. You know, both of those presidents obviously came from Southern California, Goldwater's from Arizona. And, uh, you know, in the, in the 1990s and, and early 2000s, people looked at Bush. It wasn't that he was, you know, that he was a, an evil, oppressive white man or something at least not uh, to the same degree that, you know, it would be if he was president today. It was that he was this, uh, that he was this Sunbelt, even though they're from Connecticut, but never mind that. Like he was this sort of dumbass Sunbelt evangelical fundamentalist, you know, guy who, and, and like that's, that, that, that was where the sort of, you know, I don't even want to say criticism because it wasn't that, but the name calling, like that's where it came from. And now of course it's MAGA. And so it's something that, you know, I, I think we, we have a large segment of the elite in this country uh, that has always derived their identity uh, from their, uh, you know, supposed moral superiority uh, over what they consider the bad white people in the country. And, you know, who those people are has morphed over the years, depending on uh, which region of the country or, or uh, you know, which movement has kind of risen up to challenge them. Uh, but it's but it, but it is a constant. Well, well, certainly, right. And this is actually a point that uh, I believe was Murray Rothbart made in, in the seventies, uh, or maybe it was the late eighties, because I guess he was talking about the moral majority. <clears throat> it would have been the eighties. Never mind. And it, it, I kind of came to my attention because of the, the kind of like the uproar surrounding this term Christian nationalism, which I'm not a Christian yeah. nationalist. I'm friends with a couple guys who I'm friends with Isker and you know Angle and those guys, but. It's not my crowd, but the point is, right? You see this uproar, and the reason that Rothbard is such a kind of an interesting person to t to talk to about it is, or to read about it, is that one, he's an atheist Jewish libertarian, right? Has nothing culturally in common with you know American evangelicals, but he basically makes the point that you know the whole this whole outrage around fundamentalists, the moral majority, theocrats, is manufactured. It's so obviously not the case. And now, you know, 50 years, 40 years on from that, it, it's, it's so obvious because that, that group is so much less important than they were the last time this playbook was tried and they didn't get what they wanted, right? So if it didn't work then, right, they're proportionally smaller, why would we expect it to work now? And, and yeah. to me, that seems like one of those cases where that is an enemy they like fighting. They like being able to point to, uh, you know, shall we say, uh, uh, a not particularly, you know, like optics minded preacher from Arkansas with a, with a congregation of 50, right. They like right. punching down in that way. And, you know, so all of that kind of like uproar is it's performative, you know, it's the enemy they like to fight. And I think that, that speaks to your point about, you know, that, that elite cast kind of defining themselves by being better. And you see it as well with the kind of upper middle class or middle class strivers, you know, the people who on a socioeconomic level would probably benefit from MAGA, but gain a social, like a psychic profit from saying like, no, I'm not one of those, you know, gross, dirty deplorables. I'm one of the good ones. You know, I'm the, I don't know. It's a, it's a kind of a fascinating social dynamic. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, it's it, one of the sort of interesting aspects of it is that uh, in each case you know as that group has has kind of evolved the, the bad whites group has sort of evolved over the years uh and, and transformed to different shapes um you know each of the shapes that it took at any given point in time uh were largely you know um defensive positions taken against the hostility of the elites right and then the elites themselves, like their politics to a large degree uh, was uh, was driven by that. 
uh, by, by their need to differentiate themselves. You know, people always want to identify with the group that's directly above them, and they want to, more than anybody else, they want to differentiate themselves to the group that they perceive as just below them. And, uh, you know, they do it for sociological reasons, but even psycho very deep psychological and emotional reasons, like you said. And so, you know, I think uh, over the last, say, I mean, let's say the last 15 or 20 years, um, as the internet has sort of displaced traditional media as the primary uh, culture generator in the country, you've seen this, you've seen this splintering of the culture that, uh, you know, it's hard for us to even imagine today that like, you know, if you, if you go back to like the thirties and forties, uh, when, you know, before people had televisions, you know, weekly church attendance, there'd be an average of say like 70 million people would go to church every Sunday in America, a hundred million people that same year went to the movies on a weekly basis. Right. Um, and you know, the movies back then were where people got often got like news reel footage and stuff like that. But I mean, this was, everybody was participating in, in, in that. And then it was television. You know, you, you look at uh, uh, how rapidly television was introduced into the American household to the point where you went from, you know, the point where it was a novelty really in 1940, to 1950, you're up to 90%. And by 1960, you know, it's like the cell phone. It's only some weirdo doesn't have a TV. And the average time spent in front of the television in an, in an average American household is, is, you know, four or five, six hours a day. Kids are watching four or five hours of television a day, like on average for decades. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that sixties generation that, uh, that, that kind of went nuts in the latter half of that decade, you know, that was the first generation of Americans who were raised that way, raised on television. And, you know, it, with all those traditional forms of media, the level of participation, you know, obviously there was just a much uh, more limited array of content. And so the, the participation in any given piece of content, um, especially if you think like, you know, there's not really a difference between, uh, Walter Cronkite and Tom Brokaw or whatever, like, you know, you can pick which one you want, but really it's the same content that everybody was kind of plugged into that. And that's, uh, it, it had a, you know, a definitive uh, influence on, on the shape the culture took. And, you know, starting about 15 or 20 years ago, and really like we're in the, we're in the kind of the, 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 you know, the crisis period of this now is it's, uh, it's really hard to find for, for a lot of people, it's really hard to find people in real life, you know, not on the internet, but in real life, who are sort of part of the same cultural formation that you're plugged into. And, you know, people have their friends online. If they're lucky, you know, they've got a couple friends from, you know, back in the day from college or high school or something. But, you know, a lot of people, maybe most people now, uh, you know, they they still have their, you know, their college and high school friends maybe, but they live on opposite sides of the country or something and they don't, you know, see them or even speak to them on a regular basis. So it's really a very different kind of thing. And, uh, you know, people are so, are, are sort of isolated in that sense, you know, in, in, in not being able to find people who are plugged into the same cultural formation that they are like in real life. Uh, it, it makes people isolated in a way that, is really kind of novel and it's really hard to to develop you know really uh firm kind of rooted identities uh without being around the people who share it with you on a regular basis you know or even like almost all the time like that's that's really you know you see things like it, it's one of the reasons that i've you know, I'm actually arguing with a with with a couple guys. Uh, me and and Lee Lafayette are talking to Scott Greer and and, and, and writing an article about it for uh, about, about our debate for uh, I'm 1776 um, about this. You know, whether whether um, white identity is something that is really uh, 
a realistic or or you know maybe even desirable uh, path for um, you know for for people for white Americans to sort of go down, and <clears throat> you know that's the reason I've always been kind of skeptical uh, that it is is that you know it's uh, it, it, well yeah it, go back to what we said earlier like it really is like you know to to a certain degree like an identity that you choose, right? Like to, to some degree, obviously, like I said, it's being imposed on, on white people, but how they, they choose to respond to that is a sort of, is a sort of binary, you know, you use a fork in the road that you have to figure out how you're going to respond to that pressure. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just got over a cold. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, like the, it's an identity that really was only was only sort of put together, and you know, something that people began to latch onto in response to uh, demographic transformation in the country, at least in the North and West. The South, you know, they always had kind of a sense of of white and black because they had the the, the African American presence there, and they didn't have the same uh, ethnic you know, cleavages that, that, uh, that they had in the North and West. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, in, in the rest of the country, and again, this is, we're talking about <clears throat> the part of the country, the parts of the country that are, are really affecting the culture, you know, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, the big cities. Um, it, that's, that's just, it's, it's really not the case. You know, it's something that, is not available to you as a, um, you know, like you can be aware that you have white skin. You can think of yourself as a white person. You can even, you know, may, and maybe you're starting to move down that road at this point. You can even, uh, you know, get a little uh, redness in the back of your neck when you see something online that is like a, just a blatant, you know, piece of anti-white hatred or something. Um, but realistically, like, unless you're, I don't know, like, you know, up in the mountains in northern Idaho or something like that, it, it's some compound up there. Your community is not likely to be in that same space with you, or at least they're not talking about it. It's not something that, you know, is the basis of your community or anything. And so, um, you know, it, it's something that, you know, people people think of racial identity as, like it's the it's the deepest possible identity, right? It's just you look at people and they look different. So like there's obvious differences that you know should should easily serve as the basis of you know, various identities that that should be strongly you know strongly held, especially in the face of uh, of difference and opposition within your own society. You would think that, but you know realistically, like people did not think of themselves that way uh, until relatively recently and you know it's really hard to put together an identity that includes hundreds of millions of people uh without to some extent transforming it into a, you know, like like a religion basically right like you i mean and that and that applies to like civic nationalism as well you know that's something that it, it is really um almost maybe synonymous with with civic religion uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's very tough to do that. And so, you know, I think that, I think that identities have to be, you know, sort of nested in one another. Right. So like me, like my politics basically is, um, my friends and my family. And then one ring out from that, the friends and family of my friends and family, and then I might say, well, the, the city that I live in um, or the state that I live in sort of uh, provides an environment for those people that I care about as like my primary locus of concern uh, to live a life that is, that is basically free and, that, you know, we can we can we can uh, share together. And you can, you know, maybe you can expand that out to the to the country as a whole and say that. You know, obviously, like uh, my identification with that is going to be a little bit looser uh, than it is with my friends and my family. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I recognize the fact that this larger 
to this larger system kind of nurtures and and provides the environment for these ones closer to home to to thrive. And so I, I feel deep, you know, some deep attachment to that as well. Uh, but we've kind of, you know, and, and we've done this in so many ways um, for for a few reasons. Uh, you know, we, we've sort of reversed that process where people their their identity with their community or with their friends and even their family. And this isn't to say people don't love their family, but like in terms of like a like a strong group identity, those really don't have much influence on people anymore, uh, on a lot of people. Uh, but they'll identify very strongly with, you know, Christian nationalism or white nationalism or the American civic religion or, you know, and you see like a parallel uh, with how people don't know anybody on their city council or the name of their mayor, but, you know, they can tell you all 17 of the Republican candidates in the primary in 2016, right? Everything is sort of, you know, your, their attention, their identity is all cast out to the periphery, you know, to things that are far away from them and, and, and really don't have uh, any kind of uh, bearing on their lives on a regular kind of day-to-day -day lived experience basis. And all of those things close to home have become kind of ephemeral and floating. And, uh, you know, that's not a, that, that's, that's a healthy society can't be built that way. It has to be built from the inside out, you know, not, not from the outside in like that. Well, and it reminds <clears throat> me, and look, I think we're all in a, in a kind of a similar situation where, you know, we don't have immediate access to a, you know, a healthy culture and an immediately available identity. Right. And one of the, the kind of corrosive things about modernity is that, you know, many of those bonds would have been unchosen, but also sort of inconvenient. Right. Like it's inconvenient for your aged parents to live at your house. Right. It's inconvenient yeah. for you to have to source everything you use in your life from, you know, your immediate area a village, you know, in the kind of like oldest sense or, you know, what you can get on a train. Right. But at the same time, <clears throat> it forced you to have connection. And when many of these things became optional, you know, it, you sort of had to move against your national, your natural inclination to maintain those bonds, right? It's easier to send your mom to a, a nursing home than it is to take care of it for yourself. And, and so, you know, a few generations of that, right, of doing the, the economically rational thing, uh, of dividing labor, right, of, of sort of atomizing has sort of broken that that natural chain that would have tied you to a you know a previous order. And so I think that you know you're 100% right about the fact that people are atomized even within these kind of like online communities. And I have sort of an odd relationship with the internet. Obviously you and I are having this conversation vectored through the thing, but you know the purpose of the internet is not to win the internet right? Not to get the maximum number of friends and followers, right? It's to use it as something to bring something into the real world. And I think that, you know, it is sort of, I don't mean to get off on this, but it is sort of this, like, I don't know, it's sort of the siren song, right? Of like, oh, this is better than the real thing, right? It's almost more real than real. And so, you know, the internet, like many things has, I mean, Facebook is the great example of this, right? Like I was technically alive when Facebook was just getting started, but I wasn't on it. But you know, the original purpose of Facebook was essentially to act as a sort of sup, like a supplement, you know, an additional tool to your normal social life. But if not Facebook, like the things that came down from it have sort of offered us, you know, a, a social interaction that's more fun than talking with the people actually around you because they may not be interested in the same hyper niche thing that you are. You know, you're not a celebrity at your local pub, but you could be on the internet. And so I think that like many other things, right, once it became optional, right, once you didn't really have to go outside and talk to people to get a social interaction, I mean, you should, right? But once you didn't have to, you know, once you didn't have to have a cohesive community around you just to not die, you know, to have someone take care of you when you're old, you know, a lot of people dropped it. And I think that, you know, like junk DNA is, you know, was famous a few decades ago. It's like, it seemed like it wasn't necessary. It seemed like it was just a vestige of a previous order. But I mean, like, just look at, you know, any kind of measurable, right? People are miserable. They're killing themselves. Their quality of life is terrible. 
And so, you know, even if those things didn't appear to have immediate needs, I think that the crisis we're in is a crisis of essentially having eliminated all of those unchosen bonds, or at least pretending we have eliminated them. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you said uh, a second ago, sorry, you're, you're cutting out a bit, so I'm, I lost my train of thought, but. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do, do you, was it the unchosen bonds, the more real than real? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I, yeah, that was it. So you, you, the more real than real part is, I mean, that's, that's, it's really not uh, a figure of speech even, I don't think like, um, you know, in one sense, you know, real is something you can touch with your hands, I guess. But, you know, as far as a person's lived experience is concerned, you know, something's real. Um, if it has an impact on you, if it affects you, you know, and people, they, and this is, I think, even truer as you go down the chain of social media uh, platforms, you know, like as far as, um, you know, the Facebook, which has a bunch of sort of middle-aged and older people on it and, and others as well. But like uh, you move to Twitter, there's not a whole lot of, you know, um, elder boomers, like in, as far as real numbers on there. And then you go to like TikTok where it's a bunch of Zoomers. And as you go down that chain, you know, you see more and more that uh, people kind of treat the real world, our world, the physical world. Um, it's really just like a like a mine that they crawl down into to find content for their online world, which is in a lot of ways, like like you said, like much more real to them. You know, um, <clears throat> and you see like you see this on Twitter where. You know, there's this weird phenomenon now, right, where the New York Times can run a story where they're quoting government officials saying, yeah, there might be aliens, like there's UFO things flying around. We don't know what they are, but they're definitely not man-made as far as we know. And that just, it's just out of the news in like a day or the Jeffrey Epstein thing. It's like you have this just insane story that Im implicates the most powerful people in the world. He gets killed under just the most absurd circumstances ever. 75% of people all think he was murdered. And yet it just sort of goes in and out of the news. And it's because, you know, with, with so much of our lives taking place online now, it uh, th th there's this weird alchemy that can take pretty much anything. I mean, I, I feel like I, 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 we could do this with a world war where you know, take pretty much anything and it sort of gets stepped down uh, by a process just being transformed into a piece of content. And it's how people experience it, you know, unless the bomb drops on, on their house or something. And <clears throat> it changes people when you approach the world that way, you know, like, um, I don't want to get started on this because, you know, I'll, I'll keep you here for another hour as I rant and rave. But um, you know, I see this uh, ever since October 7th with what's going on in Gaza. I see a lot of people who I've known for a while online uh, and, you know, spoken to sometimes at, at conferences or, or, you know, direct messages and stuff. And I think you have a pretty good idea that this person is, you know, rational, sane, well-intentioned person who cares about, you know, people and so forth. And you know, the way they, they talk about what's going on in Gaza right now makes it very clear that, like, if this is just a piece of content to them, you know, because if, if you know, if, if this was real to them, like, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't talk about it in the way that they do, you know, um, people, normal people, people with kids who are cracking jokes about, uh, about, you know, kids getting blown to pieces and stuff and really meaning it, like, in a, in kind of a, malicious way you know and these are people who just never would have done that before under under normal sort of meat space rules they just they, they they wouldn't talk like that and you know they 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 wouldn't have the personality that, that that would have led them to do that and you know like what comes out of your mouth uh to a large extent ends up determining uh, what that personality is and so it you know has this has this effect on you like what you put out into the world and uh, 
yeah, it's so so it's changing people. It's polarizing us. It's making people, uh, you know, I think less able to relate to other people in the real world. I mean, you've really seen an acceleration of this since COVID, where you know, like so many people that that I know in real life, like yeah, they still go to their job. Yes, they still have some friends and you know, maybe even like outwardly to somebody else, like things are not that different, but they're like low, low grade agoraphobics. They have social anxiety that is, you know, if not crippling, it at least makes it so that after hanging out for a while with even, you know, their, their quote unquote close friends, they're looking for the exit and they get home and shut the door and sort of breathe a sigh of relief that they can finally relax, you know, and this is sort of an epidemic, you know, people are forgetting how to relate to people in a, in an intimate way in a close and meaningful way in the real world. And partly I think that's a result of the way people behave on the internet, the, the, the behavior that, you know, that medium sort of elicits from people. Um, <clears throat> but then it's also just, you know, what you said, like, you know, we're in a, uh, a place where the relationships that are that are close to home you know they d- they do feel much more transient and ephemeral and you know the idea of having like a strong sense of collective identity with the people that you're interacting with uh, in in a day-to-day sense um is is sort of gone and so you know it leaves you kind of in a state of feeling that li- like you don't ne- like you don't always know who it is that you're talking to and so everybody is more of a stranger than uh, people would have been used to in just a few years ago. Well, in, in addition, right, it goes back to that idea of your chosen <clears throat> versus unchosen identity. Because, you know, the whole thing about the Internet is you can be anyone. You know, you can adopt any persona. And so when we see these weird paraphilias that have sort of started to, like, spread into the real world, Right. Like I'll use a, a humorous example because no one will get their feelings and hurt about it. But like furries. Right. Like that is something that only can exist, you know, when you have that complete and total control over how you present, you know, and then it sort of yeah. leaks into the real world. I mean, pronouns. Yeah. Right. The way pronouns are described, like that's something could only have existed in text based format. Right. Like you can't right. in real life have your I and mean, I guess they put pins on themselves, which is <laughs> equally ridiculous. Right. But that is. You know, that is something that is born of Tumblr culture, forum culture, Twitter, all of these things. And so again, right, I don't, I, I, and I, I wish I had an answer for this, right? But when these sort of created fake ersatz assumed identities kind of meet with that, that external suffering, right? Do they hold up to it? Because the unchosen ones, right, you know, kind of like family, kith, kin, those seem to. Right. Like you you did a series and I'll just briefly reference this, right. All about kind of, you you know, minors and collective action. Right. And well, how are they able to collectivize? Well, they have a, they have a common struggle, right. They have the mind boss. They have, you know, the Pinkertons or the kind of like rent a cops who've come in to oppress them. Right. They have a common goal and a common enemy. But when you're, you know, your assumed identity, your assumed community is like a group chat you know, or a particular like sexual kink or effectively like a lifestyle choice. That, that's not a, that's not real in the same way. And so, you know, you have this idea that, which, which I kind of like, right. That we're sort of exiting a period of fakeness from a certain perspective, right. That the kind of the politics, the mythology, you know, and you even mentioned it with the baby boomers kind of identifying with the consumer choice more, that period of fakeness is kind of coming to the end to its end. You know, and part of that is born in the incredible intensity to politics, right? Where these questions of identity are now at the core of everything. But I don't know. I, I don't really know where that develops from here. But it is it, it's certainly something I have enjoyed. Not enjoyed. I'm interested in in watching because that is a very fundamental thing, right? Like how humans group together. Yeah, it's it's fundamental to understanding. Uh, everything else that you read about history or politics. Uh, and, you know, I think everybody probably has a grandfather or an uncle or something who uh, <clears throat> would say that, 
I, uh, some version of, you know, they talk about the state of the country these days, the state of the kids these days, whatever it is. And uh, they'll say some version of, you know, what this country needs is another good war, another big war. That'll, that'll bring us together, that 9-11, 9-12 kind of thing, right? That'll bring us back together. And, you know, there's some, they're, they're not wrong, you know, or, or at least they're not necessarily wrong. Sometimes societies can be stressed beyond their limits. But, you know, it is true that, you know, conflict and opposition and being forced by circumstances to come together to uh, face a common challenge. That is, you know, the primary way that, uh, that identities have been forged throughout history and, and strengthened and, and rejuvenated throughout history. Um, but you sort of, uh, you know, you kind of, and, and to speak to some, one, one other thing that you just said, actually, like these, you can kind of tell how fake an identity is by how desperate they are to manufacture crises for themselves and manufacture enemies for themselves, you know? Well, and um, also to I, demand outside <clears throat> recognition, you know? Right, right, right. And so, uh, you know, are we going to have to have some sort of a, a defining conflict that's going to, that's going to sweep over us and will make these decisions for us? You know, maybe it'll, you know, it, it, maybe it's a world war and, all of a sudden we're all Americans again, or, you know, maybe it's uh, something closer to home and we splinter in ways that really can't be put back together. It's kind of hard to say right now, um, except to say that, uh, you know, when it comes, we probably won't be ready for it. And uh, the choices that it presents to us uh, are very likely not, not, not going to be ones that, uh, any of us are a hundred percent comfortable with. So. Well, well, definitely. So Daryl, we are a little over time. If people <clears throat> want to find your work, what's a good way for them to do that? Um, I have a Substack, um, martyrmade.substack.com, but, uh, really just go to the, uh, podcast feed. Um, just look for martyr made on iTunes or, uh, Spotify, whatever you use, or look for the unraveling. That's, uh, the, the show I do with Jocko, um, and check them out and see what you think. And then if you want to go check out the Substack, there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, on there that, that's not out in the public side. But yeah, check out the podcast. And again, man, thank you so much for coming on. This was a great time. As far as my stuff, yeah. you guys could, oh, sorry. My bad. No, I was just going to say sorry for taking so long. Like I could go on for another two hours with you. So, Oh, not at all, man. This was a, a really enjoyable <laughs> conversation. Great. And as far as my stuff, you guys can find me on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to support us more directly, the best way to do that is to check out our sponsor, Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching. I've been on the Cerberus program there, and I've been working out for a long time and love this program. Uh, JD really knows what he's doing. He's incredibly responsive if you have questions or you need <clears throat> to take time for an injury or something. So I highly recommend that. Uh, and again, Daryl, thank you so much. Yeah, it was fun, man. Anytime. And to anyone at home, remember... Keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night. Mm -hmm.